Okay, so um, today we're going to start our new uh, set of papers. And the first paper we're going to talk about is metastable failures in the wild. Um, I happen to know the authors of this paper, so um, yeah, um, I will present this. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. So um, I guess before I go into the actual paper, um, I want to uh, briefly talk about uh, briefly talk about you know what do we want from the from the systems running in the cloud, right? And there are a lot of things that we you know, really care, right? And, and and we want a lot of things. You know, we want performance uh, from our systems, right? Uh, we want the systems to be fast, like. Um, when I think about fast systems, I think about airplanes, right? They go, you know, from one point to another, you know, really fast. Uh, but performance is kind of overloaded term, right? There are different types of um, different types of performance. You know, sometimes we want to be able to carry a lot of stuff, right? Like like a cargo ship does. So um, you know, we want both kinds of performance from our systems. So that kind of makes our airplane, you know, mixed with the cargo ship, right? So, so that, that's, that's our desire. Uh, but then we also want this, uh, you know, thing to be efficient, right? Uh, um, the efficiency, you know, just like performance is an overloaded uh, term and it comes in multiple flavors. You know, one way to say that, you know, we're efficient is, um, you know, to say that we use all the resources that we have. Like here I have, you know, empty spaces on this cargo ship airplane. So we want to make sure that we fill those spaces if we want to be efficient. Um, but we also want, um, you know, our systems um, you know, to be able to use those resources efficiently, like, and, and do as much work with as little resources as possible. So this would be like, um, you know, combining this thing with a Toyota Prius or something. Um, my Photoshop skills are not that great, so I'm just going to write 100 miles per gallon, and then, you know, we can move on. Uh, we want reliability, right? And metastable failure paper is all about reliability, really. Um, and, you know, what does it mean to build reliable systems? Well, we often make systems redundant so that if something fails, um, you know, we can continue operation. Um, and we also, you know, under this reliability umbrella, we can say that uh, we want the systems to be maintainable, but right? we want to be able to fix the system, um, you know, fix some failure while the system is operating without, um, you know, the clients and the users uh, really noticing that. So. Um, you know, that's like having this um, R2Z2 fixing the, the broken engine while this whole cargo ship airplane is flying. And, and, and there are like a whole bunch of other things that we really want, you know, from the cloud. We want the systems to be scalable, elastic, secure, etc. Right? Um, so the, the, the thing is, we not only want to build those systems, we actually try to build those systems. Right? And, you know, last time I like looked up in the sky at the airplane, you know, I, I, I don't see those, those things flying. So, you know, we kind of fail to build those things because, well, a lot of the things that go in here, are, they, they contradict each other, right? So, and I think, you know, this is kind of the theme of the metastable, uh, metastability paper uh, is that, um, you know, we want a lot of things and we make certain decisions and, uh, we end up hurting the reliability of the system. So, um, in my view, um, you know, talking about metastability is really talking about the trade-offs that we make, uh, you know, with the reliability, right? We may want to make, we, we want the systems to be reliable, but if we make them maybe faster, it, it may compromise some things, right? And, and obviously we want the systems to be faster and obviously we want to be uh, efficient and so on and so forth, but you know, do these choices that we make, uh, do they compromise uh, reliability? And that's kind of the, the, the big question of the metastability paper and uh, uh, the things that we observe uh, by you know, going through a bunch of post-mortem reports in that paper. You, so if you look at the history of bridge building, people kept building longer and longer bridges and they would fall down, they make them heavier and heavier and they fall down, bigger and bigger. And then figuring out that balance between the heaviness of the bridge, the length of it, and all of these pieces took year, thousands of years. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, you know, we are in the same process really here. And, um, you know, I, I put this picture of, you know, these kids playing this like four-way tug of war, right? You know, if you pull too much on one side, you know, the, the other side will pull. Now, our job is really to replace this rope with the bungee cord. <laughs> so we can pull on one side and, and, and make it stretch without, you know, pushing other kids uh, over as much. Um, you know, trying to figure out those trade-offs, you know, what can we trade off without, um, you know, maybe sacrificing um, things too much for our particular use case, right? Um, maybe the systems are not as universal as we want them to be, right? We, we really want to account for use cases. But anyway, um, let's look at this kind of hypothetical example of, of, of a system going into um, the metastable failure. Right, so let's say, you know, we have a system that can do 1,000 requests per second and, um, you know, it's serving 700 requests, 750 requests per second right now. That's kind of the, the normal load of the system, the offered load, you know, this is what maybe the, the clients, the users ask the system. Um, and, uh, well, it turns out that, you know, this system is in a metastable or vulnerable state, potentially. Right, even though it operates, uh, you know, perfectly fine right now. So um, the problem, yeah the, yeah, the problem really starts with a trigger, right? So it's something we call a trigger in in, in the context of metastable failure paper. Uh, but you know, this trigger is actually a failure of some sort, right? Um, you know, something fails in your system, you know, it can be like a hardware failure, software failure, or maybe even a failure of expectations, right? You Maybe you have expected, you know, the load to be at, at certain level at certain time, and, and this expectation failed, right? But this fail, uh, failure of a system um, acts as a trigger. And, um, you know, what does this trigger do? It overloads the system. Right, so if we have a, a, a substantial enough issue going on, capable of overloading the system, capable of, you know, taking the load above what the system in its current configuration can handle, you know, we end up in this overloaded state, which is really bad, right? So this is where engineers are going to be like trying to fix stuff, right? Um, you know, this is where um, if you have, a, again, like the system that serves, you know, stuff to your users, once you enter the overloaded state, state, you're going to have, um, you know, this request start to queue up longer and longer, potentially timeout, potentially, you know, not return to the clients, you know, start dropping work, losing work, all kinds of stuff, right? So this is that. And, and this is what you know, we try to fix, the engineers try to fix. So um, what kind of triggers, you know, we observe uh, by like looking at a bunch of metastable a bunch of failures in, uh, in, in the wild from, from the post-mortem reports. Um, you know, why do they happen and why do they cause problems? So we identified two like broad types of triggers. You know, one type of trigger, we call it load spiking trigger, and it just takes the workload and um, you know, spikes the workload essentially, right? So it, it increases the workload. Um, this can be like uh, an unexpected workload spike like I had in my um, you know, picture in the previous slide. Uh, it can be other things like you know, maybe you know workload changes. Maybe a new hotkey emerged, and you know that really changed the workload to like particular um, system, right? Um, and another type of triggers is, is a, a capacity degrading trigger, right? So that would be you know server failures, network partitions, like anything that takes away the capacity of your system. Um, and um, you know this kind of the ability to handle those triggers is, is, is a fundamental trade-off that, that we always kind of pay uh, when we design the systems. And that's between the, you know, the, the utilization of our resources and the reliability of the system, right? So intuitively speaking, right? If we run a system close to its limit, then the system will have no spare capacity, no wiggle room to absorb some of the smaller triggers, right? So maybe, you know, as in the bucket of water to this aquarium will, you know, cause this fish to spill over, you know, that, 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 that's bad, right? So this is, um, you know, this is, this is kind of the, the situation, right? We could not absorb uh, additional stuff. We cannot absorb those problems because we run too uh, close to the capacity. So obviously, uh, if you run not as close to the capacity, you can absorb, you can tolerate bigger, 
fluctuations and your load and your capacity changes and so on and so forth, but you are not running as efficient. You're like wasting a lot of resources idle in a common case. Um, so, you know. Define you, wasting. What is it, Pat? Define wasting. Yeah. Uh, I mean well, wasting in the sense that you're not utilizing them at the given, uh, 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 in, in a normal case. I well, get it, but... You, you, you're utilizing them to absorb those fluctuations. Right, that's the question. So, um, anyway, let, let's, uh, yeah, let's get back to uh, this kind of metastable example, right? Once we have this big problem happening, we, we have an overload, you know, engineers uh, running around crying and trying to fix the, 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 the problem. Um, what we found out is that a lot of systems, they don't just stop in this overloaded state uh, because of this initial problem. They actually uh, dig themselves in a, in, a, in a deeper, like overloaded uh, state, right? So, so they amplify the overload, they, they dig their own grave essentially. Um, and sometimes this can be kind of difficult to see, especially in the rush of the moment, you know, when engineers are trying to fix this initial problem, right? Uh, things are already crash, and so, you know, why does it matter if they crash more, right? Uh, like, how do you even define that, you know, when things are bad, if things are worse? Like, if you don't have good enough telemetry, it's, it, it may be easy to miss, right? But, um, you know, we, we, we have those amplification effects that uh, somehow um, overload the system uh, more and more. And just like with the triggers, we define two types of amplification effects. We have the, the workload amplification, you know, something that takes your initial workload, you know, the, the operate workload and um, you know, makes it multiply, right? Um, a good example of this is, uh, is a retry store, right? So uh, retry patterns um, you know, will amplify, multiply the work. Right, multiply the, the requests that you, you have to do. Um, another type of amplification that we see is capacity degradation. Um, and um, an example of this would be like a garbage collection, right? So if you're running your system, um, you know, maybe uh, there's like a lot of memory uh, consumption under a, a lot of memory pressure uh, because of all the outstanding you know, requests that you have to process. Um, you know, the garbage collection kicks in, it pauses the, the world, pauses the system for, you know, some little amount of time. Uh, but, you know, this pause creates like bigger queue, more requests, uses more memory, which, you know, in turn will require more garbage collection and, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, the more you do it, the more uh, you degrade the capacity of your system. Um, and uh, the amplification um, effects, they have two very important properties. The, the amplification rate, which is how quickly this amplification effect, um, uh, you know, contributes to increasing the overload of the system, right? So how quickly the, the amplification acts. Um, and amplification limit, right? For some amplification effects, we may have an upper bound on how much more, um, you know, load we can expect from this particular amplification uh, effect or how much capacity can degrade, right? So um, two very important properties to keep uh, track of when we talk about amplification. So, um, you know, speaking of um, uh, the amplification limit, right? This limit is actually uh, very important because it allows us to reason about the stable state of a system, right? And um, you know what is a stable state? Um, in this case, the stable state is um, a, a performance state of a system where, um, like, if, if you if you operate the system um, in a stable region, like uh, if you don't load it above this region, if you don't have don't don't bring so much work that, that it's above this stable region, then um, no matter the uh, you know no matter the trigger, um, uh, your amplification effect. Uh, is not going to um, kind of cause the metastable failure. Like you, you're still going to fail because of an overload, right? You're still going to experience the overload. But once you can fix it, uh, it will kind of slowly, uh, you know, the system will fix itself, right? So uh, this stable region is kind of very, very important to reason about um, this uh, efficiency trade-offs that, um, you know, I showed with the aquarium picture. 
right? If you can operate your system in a stable region, then you don't really have to worry about the metastable failures. Like you still have to worry about other failures, but the metastable failures are not that big of a problem for you anymore because the system will recover um, on its own once you fix those initial like, trigger problems. So how does the um, the failure actually actually happen, right? So we amplify this uh, overload, uh, you know, over some time, and finally the engineers they they fix the problem, right? They fix what they perceive to be the problem, this initial trigger, initial failure, and you know we may start to observe some improvement in 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 in, in your system, right? Like the the load in my example here may actually go down, right? But um, you know if we fixed this uh, trigger too late, right? If we let the amplification run for too long um, and it amplified the load so much that this initial trigger, once it's fixed, once we, you know, maybe return this capacity or remove this, um, you know, extra load, right? Uh, what, 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 once this is fixed, we're still in the overloaded state. And what does it mean for us to be in the overloaded state? Well, the amplification effect still continues, right? So we may see like a, a, a momentary improvement uh, and then you know amplification will uh, continue doing its job and uh, you know continue digging the hole and, and, and pushing your system into a worse and worse state. So that's what we call metastable failure. Um, and um, you know, like the, the the entire idea of of metastability, metastable states uh, comes from physics, right? So um, initially, you know, we run the system in this metastable state. The trigger acts as some force that we add, like, uh, you know, in this case, we put it on the edge, right, on the edge of the failure. If we apply just enough force, you know, big enough trigger, the system will fail into this completely inoperative uh, state, right, uh, this, like, big minimum. And, and, and to fix it, we need to, like, apply a lot, a lot more force to, to bring the system back up into its operational state right here in, at one. So, how do we actually fix it? You know, the the basic principle of you know getting out of metastable failure is to take your load, your normal load, not the amplified load, not you know the triggers. Once you fix the trigger, um, you know you still have like underneath all of this nonsense somewhere. You have your organic load that, that somehow continues, right? Um, you need to take it below the stable state, and if you do so. Um, then the amplification is not going to be able to, um, you know, catch up quickly enough. Now, this can be very difficult, uh, right? Um, as, as I mentioned, like this stable region really depends on the uh, amplification um, effect properties, uh, particularly the, the limit. Uh, so it's hard to know where is this stable region sometimes. Um, you know, it may be hard to, uh, you know, make this decision that, hey, you know, I, I want to just, you know, um, right away deny the service to my clients, uh, you know, at the beginning, right? Um, I mean, you still fail them, but, uh, you know, some, so, some of these decisions can be like, more difficult to make, make uh, at the, the engineering level, uh, just, you know, from, from psychology of things. Like, um, to fix the system, I need to, you know, make the system deny work, deny, like, clients and, and users and requests and so on. So, uh, but if you do this, uh, you know, the system will gradually return to like a normal state. Um, you know, how gradually that, that will depend, it may take very long time. So in practice, you know, what we observed is, um, you know, people like to reboot their stuff. Like once they exhausted all the, all the um, options, once they don't know what's going on, why the system is still um, overloaded, why, you know, things are still bad, uh, they just flip the switch. Right, uh, without like realizing, you know, or, or really knowing that it will help, but they hope it will help. You know, <laughs> works on your like laptop on, 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 on a cell phone and whatnot. So um, they flip the switch, and what this usually does is allows you to like clear up the queues and you know drop all of the outstanding work and kind of start from from the beginning. Uh, so helps a lot, not all the time, but helps a lot, and and helps you kind of bring your system without you realizing that uh, in, in a stable region sometimes. So, um, you know, speaking about this um, kind of, uh, why do we end up in these amplifications? Why do we end up in these triggers? And, and that's again about like 
a lot of that stuff is about trade-offs, right? You know, if we look at uh, retries, which was one of the most popular type of trigger that we had in the paper, you know, uh, a, a retry mechanism is 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 great, you know, for um, you know for, for, for some of the performance aspects, right? If you have a transient failure, a retry can hide it, so it kind of helps your availability for transient failures, right? You know, your request gets lost somewhere, you'll not a big deal, you'll time out, you'll retry and you'll get the response back and you can see, you know, you can hide those small failures entirely from your clients, from your users, you know, really good. Um, not so good if your system is overloaded and every single retry you do essentially is going to get queued up somewhere and uh, at some point the system will need to figure out what to do with this request, right? Um, so you're creating memory pressure, you making you're asking the system to do potentially repeated work and so on and so forth, right? So you know that's kind of a, a small trade-off you have to make, right? Um, the bigger uh, trade-offs that we observed uh, again in the paper, um, you know, come from um, over optimizing the common case, right? So if you have um, a system that you know works well. 90% of the times and not so well and slower in 10% of the times. And, you know, and if somehow you can guarantee that this is going to stay the same, then, well, you can provision adequate resources and so on, right? To, you know, have this fast common case and slow exception case um, and, and, and continue to operate. Um, but if something changes, if your workload changes, if, you know, something fails, uh, maybe this common case is, is the cache and the exception case is when the you know, there is a cache miss and the system goes to like a, a slower storage, right? So something happens, um, the workload changes, you know, you're asking the keys that are not in the cache or, you know, the, the cache and machine fails, you all of a sudden have to go more to the database. Uh, well, now you're going to exercise this slow pass a lot more often. Um, and, you know, that's, first of all, that's a trigger, uh, but this can also be uh, an, an amplification, right? Um, uh, one example that I can make is kind of the, the transactional systems, really, right? So um, without going into details on how like distributed transactions work and so on, um, in, in the common case, if these transactions touch objects that are not overlapping, right? If they're all doing like their own thing and they um, don't contend on the same object and the same hot key and so on, right? Then you know these transactions are kind of isolated by default, right? And and you know we just run through them. Well, let's say you know optimistically, uh, you know using OCC and whatnot, um, run through these transactions concurrently, perfectly fine. Now, if we have something to contend on, right? If we have some hot object that you know maybe these transactions uh, um, need to access, well, all of a sudden, um, you know, this kind of common case fails, right? Um, you will have to uh, abort some transactions. The clients will probably have to retry them. Um, you know, you'll essentially create this hot key. You, you can make it even harder because you abort and retry and, you know, or stretching them or whatnot, right? So, um, you know, that will become your amplification effect. So, and, and, you know, we do it with all kinds of systems that experience the, the, the hot key behaviors. Um, so, um, you know, these are all kind of real trade-offs and real examples. There are a lot more that we mentioned in the paper. Um, here, I, you know, brief, I, I put the, kind of a table uh, with all the um, issues that we have observed and, and analyzed and, uh, you know, um, looking at the, the impact, like the severity of the impact, how long the issue lasted, what were the triggers, what were the effects, and how people fixed it. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that we saw were due to retries, uh, but, you know, we had, um, um, uh, like, uh, yeah, um, other, um, other issues, um, you know, traffic queue grows, cascades and overload, um, timeouts, retries, retries, a lot of retries, um, different types of triggers. Um, there were issues that um, essentially uh, engineers added too much debugging into um, uh, one uh, execution branch, and um, uh, I believe uh, the, the, the users started to hit this branch uh, more frequently, and that brought the system down. Uh, so that was one of the kind of trigger events, and uh, 
Yeah. So all, all kinds of things that uh, uh, can happen. Um, so, but how do we, you know, can try to, um, you know, improve things, right? We, we obviously don't want the, the systems to fail. And, um, you know, we can try to attack those metastability problems uh, by, um, you know, looking at those two components that I mentioned, the triggers and the amplification effects. Well, the triggers are your, like, you know, kind of regular average, you know, failures, right? So you cannot really design a system that doesn't have failures. Um, um, so, um, you know, that's not realistic to avoid triggers, but maybe what we can do is make systems and make algorithms more robust uh, to the triggers, right? Um, make them um, tolerant to some slowdowns, right? Make them um, uh, more stable, uh, make them more predictable in terms of, uh, of their performance. Um, so um, this uh, paper from HATOS last year, you know, talks about like a, a common um, state machine replication uh, system. So I think it talks about a few databases and shows how, you know, things slow down even when you um, fail a follower node, which is, you know, something that not supposed to happen. Like we, we expect that, you know, this like leader based systems that uh, they examined in this paper will slow down when you crash a, a leader, but, you know, they observed, you know, slow downs when you crash a follower, you know, that, that's, that's just, I mean, that's not good, right? Um, there is some, uh, what is it that? I said, who would have thunk it, but it's true. <laughs> um, there is some work um, that tries to make the slow down tolerance systems, right? So um, uh, again, uh, the basic idea is, well, don't have one leader because one leader will slow you down, right? Avoid having a single leader, avoid having the, the data flow through just one channel, one pass and whatever, avoid the data to ever be in, in, in you know, one critical place that can fail and cause you some slowdowns. And um, so like uh, this paper proposes a replicated state machine that tries to have two leaders at a time and, and complicate things quite a lot. And I, and I think it traced off some efficiency, but you know, they, they try to make things more predictable given like a variety of assumptions. Um, so, um, and, and that's kind of what I want to see, you know, from the research really, like how can we make systems more predictable um, in the face of, you know, some of these changes, uh, predictable in the face of workload changes, predictable in the face of, you know, some minor uh, crashes and failures, right? We, we should not slow down when the follower fails. I mean, uh, th th that's just not acceptable, <laughs> um, right? And and that, you know, comes down to making better, you know, systems, making better algorithms that underpin those systems. It comes down to optimizing not only the common case, but also the exception path, right? You, know, you don't want to spend so much time handling errors or handling the less common, um, you know, execution cases. Um, in one of the examples that we observed in the um, Metastable uh, Failure paper, um, there was an example of an um, Apache Cassandra cluster uh, running at an average utilization of like 10% CPU. So, so uh, it was severely underutilized cluster. Uh, but at some point in time, uh, pretty much on a timer, all of the users who interacted with this um, you know, Cassandra cluster, they uh, they were making a, some specific type of, of, of query, a specific type of request that happened to be super expensive. Like it was rare in, in their operation, but it was timed you know, on all the clients to happen at the same time and super expensive. And from 10%, um, you know, they overloaded the system outright uh, just because this you know, kind of exception pass, right? Not the common type of operation, uh, you know, overloaded the system. Right. It was too slow. So, you know, yeah, uh, optimize the exception paths, optimize not only the common case. Um, um, recently, I've been looking at, you know, like overall like stability, predictability, you know, maybe we can use newer technology. You know, people use kernel bypass to throw away some of the uncertainty that, you know, the kernel and, um, you know, switches between the user space and kernel space create an IO, right? And it makes for, you know, fast, uh, microsecond level applications, 
but I think it also can make for you know more stable uh, type of, uh, of software. And of course, you know the question is how stable can we make all of the things given all other uncertainties that have that we have in like our cloud environments and shared environments. But you know, at least we should not make like you know outright mistakes of uh, you know just focusing on common case and uh, you know making the the algorithms that like super favor one execution versus another. So. Can I make an observation? Yeah. When, when I read queuing systems theory, there's a difference between an open network and a closed network. Mm -hmm. Hard real time, you have to clearly do admission control, clearly yeah. have predictable execution for each st state in the thing. And that is what you do things like fly by wire to control an airplane when you have a software system to do that. Um, so much of everything we do is just not going to work that way. Yeah. like Linux and shared networks and, 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 and. And so all of this becomes probabilities. All of it does. And you have Poisson arrivals. You could do admission control, but it's still all probabilities. And so the question is that trade-off of utilization and managing these things. And so we're trying to balance increasing the utilization re to reduce the cost of serve while creating systems that dampen proper properly and don't get into this amount of stable behavior. And you've correctly identified a couple of wonderful techniques, which is admission control and load shedding. And that retries are just this painful thing that we just kind of have done, but they cause worse and worse behavior. There was a wonderful blog post by Colin McCarthy about, you know, the coffee burner and thing. And, and he was basically pointing out that in some of the Amazon systems now, they're actually taking the exception keys, control plane handling and constantly having a constant load for the control plane, even when there are no problems, so that you have reserved capacity to handle the problems. And all of that has to do with getting the feedback as you're throttling the utilization up to increase stability at the expense of some utilization. Yeah, yeah. And well, it, it plays down into, you know, making things more predictable, right? Which is why I love quorums. Yeah, so, um, so far, you know, I kind of talked about, you know, making those things you know, predictable and, and, and better to try to avoid the triggers, right? But once, you know, if you're past that stage, right, um, you know, as I mentioned, like we cannot eliminate the triggers and sometimes, you know, we will not be able to, no matter what we do, I suppose, um, completely get rid of this, right? We, we will still get into the stage where some stuff may start, like the overload will start to amplify towards this metastable failure. So the second, you know, kind of line of work, um, you know, kind of, you know, things are already bad, but, you know, we still need to focus on this, is can we attack the amplification mechanisms, right? So there is one problem, of course, with attacking the amplification mechanisms is that we don't really know what they are. Um, uh, sometimes we do, like, retries, you know, this is an obvious one, but, um, you know, there are a lot of, like, they, they can come up from, from a lot of uh, different places. Like a garbage collection, maybe not an easy one to identify, um, right? So we need to identify those feedback loops first, this amplification mechanisms. And, uh, you know, it comes with a few issues. Um, you know, you start to see this amplification, you know, when your system is overloaded. So you're already in a bad state and you're probably not paying attention to that, uh, looking for the amplification effects. You're paying attention to fixing this initial problem. Um, there is a lot of noise that's going to be in, in, in production systems, right? How, so, how, you know, is what you're going to see uh, going to be an amplification uh, effect of some sort, or maybe something else going in the system? Someone else is messing with something else, you know? And uh, the, the, the workload changes, you know, users coming and going. So how do we, like, deal with all the noise and try to identify those amplification things that happen? And, 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 you know, how do we find those causes of amplification? Like, it's, it's not enough to see, okay, you know, my, my uh, um, uh, workload is going up or my capacity is going down, like, but, you know, why and where it's, 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 it's happening. And, and again, you know, kind of goes back to issue number two, there is a lot of noise, very hard to make those uh, correlations. Um, but if we somehow know, manage to, to, to know what amplification effects we have, you know, there are really three options. We can eliminate the loops. We can control the maximum amplification, right? 
So um, that will buy us a bigger stable region, make it easier to recover, uh, or uh, actually you know, make us run the system entirely in a stable region if it's uh, financially possible. Um, and we can you know, control the rate, which really gives you the time to recover the initial problem before you um, amplify this overload so much that um, you actually go into a stable failure. So if we can control this somehow, if we can design the amplification mechanisms, um, that would be your, you know, I'll say, second or third line of defense, um, you know, against uh, th those kinds of issues. Like some examples, right, you know, with, with loops, you know, if you don't do retries, right, well, that, that will eliminate the, the amplification load due to retries entirely. You know, if you control max amplification, well, set the, the maximum number of retries, which, you know, by the way, we normally do these things. So it just, uh, sometimes it's not enough. Um, and, uh, you know, set some retry budget or, you know, ret retries back off, right? Um, you know, increase the time between the retries. Um, do not admit more than a certain number of retries, so certain number of requests in general. And that kind of brings me back to the last point I wanted to talk is, you know, admission control, which um, I think is one of the more universal ways to um, uh, control the amplification, right? Even if you don't know the loop uh, or the feedback mechanisms, the amplification loops you have, they all feed on an overload, right? And admission control can help you, you know, deal with this overload, right? So, um, and, you know, this is kind of what, what Pat was saying in his comment, right? You know, shedding work, uh, uh, prioritizing certain work, uh, which, you know, can be difficult sometimes because what, you know, like the, the priorities will different depending on, 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 on different stakeholders, right? If you ask maybe your users, you know, they want the, the, the requests. If you ask, you know, engineers, um, the priority may be doing some work that will actually, you know, bring the system into a healthier state. Right, so um, maybe maybe you'll have to make a choice to let's say throttle hotkeys uh, so that the rest of the system doesn't go down. Definitely not, you know, the good thing to do for your you know users and clients, but maybe a good thing to do for the overall um, it, health of your system. And stable prioritization is extremely hard in a world where you have low priority work coming into a high priority server to service it, which is then shared. The sharing environments and prioritization across shared environments is really subtle and hard. So, and uh, yeah, that's kind of all I have for my uh, little presentation today. More than happy to uh, discuss. Any questions, comments? Question. So is admission control the solution? Because the first paper read it like read like it is a solution. I think out of all examples, I can remember the only one which was not solved by admission control load shading was the one where a logical network link uh, all uh, went through one single physical link instead of like four or whatever. And the rest of them looked like they could be solved by just better admission control and load shading. Well, um, I, I wouldn't say, you know, it solves all the problems all the time, but uh, I, I would argue that this makes it better, it makes it easier to solve problems. And it definitely helps regardless of, you know, what your issue is, um, right? If you do it properly, if you know, you know, what to prioritize, if you know uh, what to drop, if you know, uh, you know, how to, how, how to handle this admission control. It's, but, it's, a, it's an important tool, but it's also hard to, Qual to describe what availability means when you're saying no to some admissions and yes to others. So uh, um, uh, I think, Andre, you're referring to this, uh, to the original, the, the, the short paper, right? The, the link is in, uh, imbalance. And um, well, you know, the, the problem there was, uh, you know, it, it was a bug in a code, right? Uh, and, you know, you could technically, you know, start, you know, denying the requests. So if you had some kind of admission control mechanism, you know, will it fix your amplification? No, it will, it will not fix your bug, right? Um, but if you fix the bug and apply this admission control 
you know, essentially, admission control is what you have to do at the end anyway, because you'll have to stop as much work as possible, uh, you know, for your system to restart. I mean, it was a performance bug, but as far as innocent correctness was not violated, it's the same. Like, what if your all, all your sorts are magically turned into bubble sort? That would be a bug, but the correctness is still there, right? Yeah. Uh, and obviously, the, the performance of your system will degrade significantly if that's the case. That the bubble sort. So there is another question in chat that's a loaded question, right? What systems today, um, in I guess my opinion, come closest to taking prevention of metastable failures into account? Um, I think we're getting better, like overall, maybe even without realizing, you know, the, the, the whole like scope of the problem. Um, but um, kind of, again, an, an example from the paper. Right, uh, we tried to crash. Um, maybe I should stop recording this. 